Musings. The Happiest Man According to Solon the Athenian. Video by Alex Sanderson. The following excerpt is from The Histories by Herodotus of Halicarnassus. Translation by Aubrey de Selincourt. Penguin Classics Edition. First published 1954. The following excerpt is from the 2003 Revised Edition. Pages 13 through 16. Note. The statement in brackets is my own to provide context. When all these nations had been added to the Lydian Empire, and Sardis was at the height of her wealth and prosperity, all the great Greek teachers of that epoch, one after another, paid visits to the capital. Much the most distinguished of them was Solon the Athenian, the man who at the request of his countrymen had made a code of laws for Athens. He was on his travels at the time, intending to be away ten years, in order to avoid the necessity of repealing any of the laws he had made. That, at any rate, was the real reason of his absence, though he gave it out that what he wanted was just to see the world. The Athenians could not alter any of Solon's laws without him, because they had solemnly sworn to give them a ten years' trial. For this reason, then, and also no doubt for the pleasure of foreign travel, Solon left home and after a visit to the court of Amasis in Egypt, went to Sardis to see Croesus, the king of the Lydian Empire. Croesus entertained him hospitably in the palace, and three or four days after his arrival instructed some servants to take him on a tour of the royal treasuries and point out the richness and magnificence of everything. When Solon had made as thorough an inspection as opportunity allowed, Croesus said, Well, my Athenian friend, I heard a great deal about your wisdom and how widely you have traveled in the pursuit of knowledge. I cannot resist my desire to ask you a question. Who is the happiest man you have ever seen? The point of the question was that Croesus supposed himself to be the happiest of men. Solon, however, refused to flatter and answered in strict accordance with his view of the truth. An Athenian, he said, called Tellus. Croesus was taken aback. And what, he asked sharply, is your reason for this choice? There are good reasons, said Solon. First, his city is prosperous, and he had fine sons, and lived to see children born to each of them, and all these children surviving. Secondly, he had enough wealth by our standards. And he had a glorious death. In a battle with the neighboring town of Eleusis, he fought for his countrymen, routed the enemy, and died like a brave man, and the Athenians paid him the high honor of a public funeral on the spot where he fell. All these details about the happiness of Tellus, Solon doubtless intended as a moral lesson for the king. Croesus, however, thinking he would at least be awarded second prize, asked who was the next happiest person whom Solon had seen. Two young men of Argos, was the reply, Cleobis and Bitten. They had enough to live on comfortably, and their physical strength is proved not merely by their success in athletics, but much more by the following incident. The Argives were celebrating the festival of Hera, and it was most important that the mother of the two young men should drive to the temple in her ox cart. But it so happened that the oxen were late in coming back from the fields. Her two sons, therefore, as there was no time to lose, harnessed themselves to the cart and dragged it along with their mother inside for a distance of nearly six miles until they reached the temple. After this exploit, which was witnessed by the assembled crowd, they had a most enviable death. A heaven-sent proof of how much better it is to be dead than alive. Men kept crowding around them and congratulating them on their strength, and women kept telling the mother how lucky she was to have such sons. When, in sheer pleasure at this public recognition of her son's act, she prayed the goddess Hera, before whose shrine she stood, to grant Cleobis and Bitten, who had brought her such honor, the greatest blessing that can fall to mortal man. After her prayer came the ceremonies of sacrifice and feasting, and the two lads, when all was over, fell asleep in the temple, and that was the end of them, for they never woke again. The Argives, considering them to be the best of men, had statues made of them, which they sent to Delphi. Croesus was vexed with Solon for giving the second prize for happiness to the two young Argives, and snapped out, 
That's all very well, my Athenian friend, but what of my own happiness? Is it so utterly contemptible that you won't even compare me with mere common folk like those you have mentioned? Croesus, replied Solon, I know God is envious of human prosperity and likes to trouble us, and you question me about the lot of man. Listen, then. As the years lengthen out, there is much both to see and to suffer, which one would wish otherwise. Take seventy years as the span of a man's life. Those seventy years contain twenty-five thousand two hundred days, without counting intercalary months. Add a month every other year, to make the seasons come round with proper regularity, and you will have thirty-five additional months, which will make one thousand fifty additional days. Thus the total of days for your seventy years is twenty-six thousand two hundred and fifty, and not a single one of them is like the next in what it brings. You can see from that, Croesus, that man is entirely a creature of chance. You seem to be very rich, and you rule a numerous people. But the question you asked me I will not answer, until I know that you have died happily. Great wealth can make a man no happier than moderate means unless he has the luck to continue in prosperity to the end. Many very rich men have been unfortunate, and many with a modest competence have had good luck. The former are better off than the latter in two respects only, whereas the poor but lucky man has the advantage in many ways. For though the rich have the means to satisfy their appetites and to bear calamities, and the poor have not, the poor, if they are lucky, are more likely to keep clear of trouble, and will have, besides the blessings of a sound body, health, freedom from trouble, fine children, and good looks. Now, if a man thus favored dies as he has lived, he will be just the one you are looking for, the only sort of person who deserves to be called happy. But mark this, until he is dead, keep the word happy in reserve. Till then, he is not happy, but only lucky. Nobody, of course, can have all these advantages, any more than a country can produce everything it needs. Whatever it has, it is bound to lack something. The best country is the one which has most. It is the same with people. No man is ever self-sufficient. There is sure to be something missing. But whoever has the greatest number of the good things I have mentioned, and keeps them to the end, and dies a peaceful death, that man, Croesus, deserves, in my opinion, to be called happy. Look to the end, no matter what it is you are considering. Often enough God gives a man a glimpse of happiness, and then utterly ruins him. These sentiments were not of the sort to give Croesus any pleasure. He let Solon go with cold indifference, firmly convinced that he was a fool. For what could be more stupid than to keep telling him to look at the end of everything without any regard to present prosperity? And that is what happiness is, according to Solon the Athenian. Have a good day, and may peace be with you.